The uh, second paper in this session 14 is biodegradable esophageal stent placement does not prevent stricture formation following circumferential mucosectomy in a porcine model. Be presented by Dr. Pauley and his colleagues from University Hospitals Case Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Good morning. Thank you very much for the ability uh, to present what is part of our ongoing research into the prevention of strictures following esophageal mucosal resection. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk about the use of biodegradable stents in a, in a porcine model. Uh, I have nothing to disclose personally, but I would like to say that the stents we're going to use in this uh, paper were donated by the company. Uh, they had no influence over the design, and as you'll see from the negative result, uh, I don't think it uh, affects our, uh, our results. The rate of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and GE junction is on the rise, uh, and as we know, the majority of these cases arise in segments of Barrett's esophagus. When these cancers are found and are confined to the mucosa, or if high-grade dysplasia is found in segments of Barrett's, this is traditionally treated with an esophagectomy, which as we know has a high rate of morbidity and mortality even in the era of minimally invasive esophagectomy. Uh, novel endoscopic ablative techniques such as radiofrequency ablation or cryotherapy are less invasive, uh, but they are prone to undertreatment, and because they destroy the specimen, there is no way to get a true, accurate uh, idea of what the grade and stage of disease is. Uh, endoscopic esophageal mucosectomy has been raised as an alternative to both ablative methods and to esophagectomy. It provides an intact specimen, so the uh, grade and stage uh, can be determined, and also avoids the morbidity and mortality of a major thoracoabdominal procedure. But stricture formation after EEM is common, especially if this involves greater than 75% of the luminal circumference or three centimeters in length of the esophagus. A lot of therapies have been targeted at preventing these stricture formations, and those in the literature are uh, highly proprietary, uh, rather complex. And our goal in this project was to really come up with an off-the-shelf solution. In this particular project, we hypothesized that the use of a commercially available biodegradable stent could prevent stricture formation following circumferential mucosal resection in the esophagus. This was a porcine model. We had five control animals and five stent animals. This was powered to detect a 25% reduction in the stricture uh, size. These were done under a general endotracheal anesthesia and all of the animals received a single IM dose of antibiotics before the procedure began. For the procedure, uh, we, we used a um, band and a cap snare attachment as you see in the image here, uh, we created a pseudopolyp, which was then snared off. This allowed access to the submucosal plane. And we removed a roughly eight to 10 centimeter segment uh, of the esophageal mucosa on block. Uh, on the left-hand image there, labeled A, you can see the endoscopic view of the mucosa that's been resected distally. And on the right-hand side in B, you can see the full thick, excuse me, the uh, full mucosal resection on block. Now, I want to point out that in histology, this contained mucosa only. There was no muscle involved. Uh, the segments ended at the submucosal plane. In the control group, no additional therapy was rendered. In the stent group, we placed a fully covered uh, 120 uh, by 18 millimeter self-expanding esophageal stent. The stent is made of polydioxinone, which is in the polyester family. It biodegrades uh, after about 12 weeks, but maintains full integrity for at least six weeks. And you can see in the endoscopic image there in the middle of the screen, uh, the stent in position. After the procedure, all animals underwent a, a barium esophagogram. Uh, this documented a baseline degree of esophageal diameter and the uh, total length of the uh, mucosal resection. They then underwent a repeat esophagogram every week uh, to determine the diameter of the stricture where we removed the mucosa, to determine how much the proximal esophagus had dilated, and also determine the length of the strictured segment. We set an endpoint of an 80% stricture uh, in animals that were unable to maintain weight despite a liquid dietary supplementation as our endpoint for euthanasia in the study. In the control group, you can see that the animals rapidly developed an esophageal stricture. Uh, in the inset images, you can see the baseline esophagogram at week zero with the endoscopic image, and progressing toward the screen right, you see week one and week two. Uh, in the week two images, you can see a very uh, pinpoint uh, endoscopic image of a stricture in a high-grade uh, floric floricoscopic stricture uh, with proximal esophageal dilation. None of the control animals survived beyond the third week of the study. In the stent group, we saw a very different pattern of stricture formation. For the first six weeks, it was a very low-grade stricture, uh, only about 46%. Uh, but ultimately, all of the animals in this group did develop a clinically significant stricture that mandated euthanasia based on our preset criteria, ranging from four to 14 weeks. 
Here we see an overview of what the stent group looks like. Again, starting on the left-hand side at week zero, we can see the baseline esophagogram with the stent uh, visible endoscopically and fluoroscopically. Weeks one and week two, very mild degrees of stricture formation. But at week 14, similar to what we saw before, a high-grade stricture is formed. Uh, the stent is no longer visible, uh, and this animal was ultimately euthanized. When we compared these groups, uh, unfortunately, because the control animals uh, all met criteria for euthanasia very early in the study, we elected to use the week two uh, data points. Uh, this was because all five animals in both groups were uh, uh, alive at this point, and we could compare the full set. When we did this for stricture diameter, we saw a clinically significant reduction in stricture diameter in the stented group, a difference of 78% versus 27%. Similarly, when we looked at proximal esophageal dilation, the unstented animals had 175% proximal esophageal dilation versus 131%. But this did not hold true for stricture length, where at week two there was essentially no difference between the groups in stricture length. But if we reassessed this data and looked at the last endpoint and the last measurement we had for each animal, which in the uh, control groups was week two and three, and in the stented animals was all the way out through week 14, we did see that over time, the strictured segment of the esophagus continued to progress in the animals that had a stent in place, such that they had a very long stricture that uh, shortened to approximately 60% of the original diameter versus only 43% uh, in the uh, unstented group. Again, just two more comparative photos comparing week one and week two of the uh, study. Uh, you can see that in week one in the control animals, uh, a, a stricture has already started, but in the stented animals, there's really no visible stricture, and that by week two, the animals in the control group had a high-grade stricture versus those in the stent group, which had a very mild stricture. And this ultimately resulted in a survival advantage in the stent group, uh, 9.2 weeks for the stent group versus only 2.4 weeks for the control group, again, statistically significant. We concluded from this that circumferential esophageal mucosal resection does result in a very high-grade stricture formation, and that placement of a biodegradable stent can delay the time to clinical deterioration, but ultimately cannot prevent the stricture from forming. If you look at the maximal degrees of luminal narrowing and proximal esophageal dilation, they were very similar between the groups. And as you would expect, the timing of stricture formation relates to the uh, known time of loss of radial force of the stent, as well as the time of complete stent disintegration, sometime between six weeks and 12 weeks, which is what our data bore out. The stent group could provide radial force to prevent the strictures from shortening as far as the luminal diameter, but it did nothing really to, to constrict the longitudinal contracture of the segment. Uh, this suggests that even though the stent was in place, it was not really preventing scar tissue from forming, and therefore additional therapies are clearly needed, and this is an ongoing area of research. Uh, the ability to prevent strictures uh, from forming underneath these stents, uh, either by a topical agent or a stent that lasts in position longer. Thank you very much for your time. This, uh, is this mic on? This beautifully uh, presented paper is now open for discussion. I don't see any tweets. Do you, Dr. Stigman? No tweets. Um, I, I'd like to begin. Uh, this is obviously, it might be interesting if these stents could be removed and replaced because maybe it's the time force that we're talking about. Is there any possibility? of having replacement of the stent? So uh, they, they do begin to be integrated after several weeks, so removal would be difficult, but certainly replacing a second stent uh, in at, you know, at, at a different time period, perhaps six weeks, would certainly be possible. Um, we've also discussed the possibility of making a stent that has a longer half-life in situ, such that one stent would last a longer period of time. Questions? Yes, questions at the mic right here. Hi, Sharon Bachman from Columbia, Missouri. First question, how do you get a pig to swallow barium? So th they were done under general anesthesia. Uh, we basically injected uh, through an NG tube higher up, so we sort of a forced swallow, if you will. Okay, so it was under anesthesia. It was, yes. I can't see them sitting still otherwise. No, correct. On a more serious note, do you think that the inflammatory response of using an absorbable stent played any role in the occurrence of strictures after this, or as the stent disintegrated? Uh, it's entirely possible. Um, you know, the... We, uh, on the histology, which is data that I did not present here, uh, the number of inflammatory cells between both groups uh, in the final histopathologic specimen were not statistically significantly different between the two groups. There was an inflammatory response and ulcer formation in both groups, but there did not appear to be a difference in the quantity or types of cells in both. Can, can I ask you uh, to go back to the very beginning? Because I'm going to assume that you hypothesized that if you could keep that esophageal lumen open until it were completely re-epithelialized, until the mucosa grew back, 
that you would end up with a non-strictured situation. Am I right on that? That was part of the assumption, yes, sir. Now, what I found was conspicuously absent from your presentation was the percentage of mucosal growback, uh, perhaps the subject of another study. Uh, but did you look at that? And right along the last question, did the stent help or hinder mucosal repopulation? So we did look at that in the, hist in the histology data, which I did not present here. Um, in the stented groups, there was a, a, just a rather small amount of re-epithelialization. Um, again, not enough to compare between the two groups. That was not the primary endpoint of the study. Uh, and, and whether that was simply because there was a longer period of time or whether the stent allowed re-epithelialization, I don't know. But there was some only in the stent group. Thank you for that beautiful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you.